Uh, greetings, everybody. I forgot something, so let me uh, read this to you um, real quick. In, um, let's see, Malachi chapter 4, we read, um, we read the following. Um, let's see, Malachi chapter 4 and verse 1. And this is talking about the, uh, the coming of the Lord when he destroys the earth with fire. Malachi chapter 4, verse 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts. All right, so... And all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. In other words, they're going to be totally destroyed. Verse 2, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And ye, those in Christ, shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes. Ashes. Well, that's what's left over after something burned up, right? For they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel, with the statutes and judgments. And... Malachi 4, 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, in the transfiguration, which I'll cover, I cover later on, Elijah appeared with Christ and Moses. But was that the great and dreadful day of the Lord? Was that the great and dreadful day of the Lord? No. It'll be dreadful for the wicked, but it'll be great for the those that are in Christ. So, so behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He's going to be one of the two witnesses in Revelation 11. We'll, we'll cover more of that later. I forgot to read this. And he, Elijah, shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest they come and smite the earth with a curse. All right. So, uh, yeah, this is my addition. I forgot to uh, add this to the um, Bible study. So, all right. Keep going. Uh, keep listening. We're co uh, it's coming. Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And that's eternal life. This is a part of the Judas Scepter and Joseph's Birthright book by J.H. Allen. Um... This is going to be disproving that Joseph's children were half Egyptians. Um, that's the thing about the Bible. You start looking in one place and it leads in so many other places. Uh, it's like threads of a garment. All the threads are tied together. So I'm going to break this up and we're going to make this on, we're going to read Revelation chapter 11 and hopefully you'll understand why I'm going in the direction I'm going in. All right, so let's go to Revelation chapter 11, verse 1. We're going to read the whole chapter and then we're going to read a little bit about Elijah who was my favorite 
uh, Old Testament prophet, actually did a study on him in Bible college. Um, when I was doing Bible college, they uh, said, who's your favorite prophet in the Bible? Pick, you know, take, pick and do a, a study on him. So I picked Elijah. And then I took that study and turned it into a YouTube video. And it's an hour and 40 minutes long. That's one of my longest Bible studies and uh, covers his life. And he was taken up into heaven and he's going to come back one day and confront the man of sin, the beast, the Antichrist, the son of perdition. There's only two sons of perdition in the Bible. And I did a Bible study on that too. Judas Iscariot was called a son of perdition. And the false, I think it's the false prophet. It's called the son of perdition or maybe, yeah, I think he's called the son of perdition. And then uh, John calls the, the Antichrist the beast. John that penned the book of Revelation, by the way. So, all right, Revelation chapter 11 and verse 1. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Forty-two months. Roughly three and a half years. I think it's uh, another place in the Bible. Uh, I think it says 1260 days, which roughly forty-two months. For 42 months, there's going to be hell on earth, basically. Verse 3. And I, the Lord, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days. So that's a thousand two hundred and sixty days clothed in sackcloth. Now, sackcloth and ashes was a way that they would show their repentance in the Old Testament. So, they're going to be clothed in sackcloth. They're not going to be wearing nice silk shirts and what have you. Sackcloth was, you know, like what... Um, bags of beans come in or bags of rice or whatever bags of wheat uh, it's very rough and it chafes the skin it's not comfortable so so who are these two witnesses well, i did a bible study on that too the bible declares that one of them is going to be elijah the prophet other people suspect that it will be moses for the second one, other people think it's going to be Enoch. The reason they pick Moses is because Moses was transfigured with Enoch, or I'm sorry, with Elijah. Elijah, uh, remember when Christ was on the mountain and they were transfigured before them? So that's why some people think Moses and Elijah Moses represented the law, and Elijah represented the prophets. Uh, let's go to Mark chapter 9, verse 1. And he, Jesus, said unto them, Verily I say unto you, there shall be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power and your people that call preterists that 
believe that uh, Christ's kingdom is right here, right now, and it was established um, back, back centuries ago uh, because of this statement. And um, who was standing there? Well, Elijah appeared. And I think that's what he was talking about. That there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. I believe that is talking about Elijah. So let's read verse 2. Mark 9, verse 2. And after six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John and leadeth them into an high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his raiment clothing became shining exceeding white as snow white as snow so as no fuller on earth can white them um i think a, a fuller is uh somebody that uh deals with clothing and there appeared Unto them, Elias, which is the Greek rendering of the word Elijah, and there appeared unto them Elijah, Elias with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Elias, or Elijah, was a prophet. Moses represents the law. The Law and the Prophets. Where have we read about that before? Hmm. Well, I know I've read this a dozen times, probably this, this year, but we're going to read it again. Matthew twenty-two thirty-six. 36. Someone asked Jesus, what was the most important commandment? Master, what is, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said, said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So there you go. Who gave the law? Moses gave the law from the finger of the hand of God. Moses was given the law and he gave it to Israel. He was the intermediary, the middleman. And then you had Elijah who represented the prophets. So, and there appeared unto him Elias with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. For he wist not what to say. He didn't know what to say, for they were sore afraid. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and with a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. And suddenly, when they had looked round about, they saw no man any more save Jesus only with themselves. And they came down from the mountain, he charged Jesus, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had uh, seen, till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. And they kept, uh, and they kept that saying with themselves, questioning one with another what the rising from the dead should mean. What do you mean rising from the dead? Well, you're going to learn the resurrection after I'm crucified, right? Jesus would have told them if they would have asked, and he had asked, you know, answered them. Verse eleven, and they asked him, saying. Why say the scribes that Elias must come first? 
well, why why do the Bible copyists say that a Eliah, Elias or Elijah must come first? And he, Jesus, answered and told them, Elias verily cometh first, and restoreth all things. And how it is written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be set at naught. But I say unto you that Elias is indeed come, and they have done unto him whatsoever they listed as it is written of him. And you could read in the Bible that um, John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elias or Elijah. So let's see. Let me see if I can find that verse. All right, here we go. Uh, Luke chapter 1. Verse 13. Uh, so the father of John the Baptist uh, is talking to an angel here. Uh, but the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Well, so much for the sacred name movement telling you, oh, there's no J in the Hebrew language, so his name couldn't be John, or his name couldn't be Jesus. Tell them to go to hell. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many, not all, many shall rejoice at his birth. For he, John, John the Baptist, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he, John, and he shall go before them in the spirit and power of Elias. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias, Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. John the Baptist paved the way for Christ. Now remember something. Um, the, the, I think it was the Pharisees, Maybe it was the Sadducees, I forget, but it was either one of the one or two, or maybe both. They went to Eli uh, John the Baptist and they says, "Are you Elijah? Are you Elias?" And he says, "No." And I believe John knew exactly who he was. So John came in the spirit and power of Elias, and that's why. Jesus said what he said about, um, you know, Elias had already come that we had just read. So that's my opinion. All right, so John the Baptist was sort of kind of a symbolic, symbolic of Elijah. And some people will tell you that John the Baptist was Elijah. No, no, because if that was true, that's reincarnation, which is Hindu garbage. You know, that's that's from India, Hindu. That's Hinduism, reincarnation. Well, if you don't get do it right in this life, you know, you'll just be reborn into a next one, and you know, and 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 over and over and over, you get reborn until you know you you get it right. Uh, is what they teach, but the Bible teaches that uh, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. So, <laughs> there's only one chance, people. Their reincarnation is garbage. So, all right, let's go back to Revelation 11. Um, verse 3. 
And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. What do candlesticks uh, do? They put out light. They put out light in the dark, uh, the kingdom of darkness, right? That's what they do. Verse 5. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeded, proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. So if anybody tries to shoot them, well, they're going to have a bullet go through their body and be killed. Somebody tries to cut them with a knife, well, that sword's going to kill them that way. Now, what does it mean, fire proceedeth out of their mouth? What does that mean? Is their mouth going to be a, a, like a flamethrower in the army? Huh? What? Oh, well, let's, let's take a look at that. All righty, let's go to 2 Kings chapter 1. Then Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. Remember, Ahab was married to Jezebel. 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 Uh, if you see B-A-A-L or B-E-L, um, it's refer you know, it's just different spellings of the same word. So basically Jezebel's name has Baal in it. And uh, that was the false god of Satanism. How would you like to be named after one of Satan's devils or maybe even Satan himself? I think I'll pass on that. I think I would go to court and get my name changed. But uh, I don't know if they had that back in these days. But All right. And uh, Ahab was bad news. I mean, the Bible says that Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of that. Uh, God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. I, that's kind of a paraphrase, but you get the idea. Ahab was bad. Jezebel was worse. I think she was a Canaanite woman. Uh, and Ahaziah fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria. And uh, remember, Samaria was northern Israel, not southern Judah. Samaria was the capital. And Ahaz Ahaziah fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria and was sick. And he sent messengers and said unto them, Go, inquire of Beelzebub. You know, you've heard of Beelzebub. Uh, in the New Testament, they spelled it Beelzebub. But um, in the Old Testament, they spelled it Baalzebub, B-A-A-L. Inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. So he fell down and banged himself up pretty bad. And he wants to go inquire of the devil, hey, am I going to get better or not? Verse 3. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria. So Ahaziah is the king of Samaria. And say unto them, Is it not because there is not a god in Israel that ye go to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Uh, wait a minute. Why are you guys going to talk to the devil? You know, is, isn't there a God in Israel that you can inquire of? Why are you going to the devil? Good question. Because they were a bunch of, they were a bunch of Satan worshipers. Verse 4, Now therefore, thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not come down from 
that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. And Elijah departed. And when the messengers turned back unto him, he said unto them, why are you now turned back? You know, I mean, here it is, they just left. And then Elijah talks to them and they just turn around and go back to the king. You know, who knows how long they were gone, maybe 10, 15 minutes, you know, maybe five minutes. And the king's like, wait a minute, why, why are you back so quickly? You know, wait a minute, didn't I send you guys on a, uh, um, on a, in a, on an errand? You guys, and you're back already? What's, what's up? Verse six. And they said unto him, there came a man up to meet us and said unto us, go turn again unto the king that sent you and say unto him, thus saith the Lord. Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that thou sendest to inquire of Baalzebub, the God of Ekron? Therefore thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. And he, the king, said unto them, What manner of man was he which came up to meet you and told you these words? And they answered, he was an hairy man, and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he, the king, said, It is Elijah the Tishbite, Elijah the prophet. And the king, verse 9, Then the king sent unto him a captain of fifty with his fifty. So here it is, you got fifty soldiers and the captain. So, you know. 50 plus 1 is 51. So you got one prophet and a, and a uh, 50 guys. I mean, that's like, I don't know how many of you are in the army, but uh, that's like two platoons or one quarter of a company. 50 guys. I mean, that's <laughs> you 50 guys for one prophet. And the king sent unto him a captain of 50 with his 50. And he went up to him and behold, he, Elijah, sat on the top of a hill. And he spake unto him and said, and the captain said, thou man of God, the king hath said, come down. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of 50, listen to this. If I be a man of God, then let fire, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee in thy fifty. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. Whoa. Can you imagine that? Out of Elijah spoke the words and fire came down from heaven and devoured, destroyed, burned up fifty one soldiers verse 11 again also he the king sent unto him another captain of 50 with his 50 and he answered and said unto him O man of God thus hath the king said come down quickly and Elijah answered and said unto him if I be a man of God let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy 50 and the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. Uh, this doesn't sound like a good... Uh, I, I don't think I'd want to be in that army, do you? Hmm. Verse 13. And he sent again a captain of the third 50 and his 50. And the third captain of 50 went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah. He fell on his knees before Elijah and besought him and said unto him, O man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these fifty thy servants be precious in thy sight. This captain had more sense than the other two. O man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these fifty thy servants be precious in thy sight. Behold, there came 
fire down from heaven and burnt up the two captains of the former fifties with their fifties. Therefore, let my life now be precious in thy sight. Woe. And the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah, Go down with him, be not afraid of him. And he arose and went down with him unto the king. And he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Forasmuch as thou hast sent messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, is it not because there is no God in Israel to inquire of his word? Therefore thou shalt not come down off that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. So he died according to the word of the Lord which Elijah had spoken, and Jehoram reigned in his stead in the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, because he had no son. Now the rest of the acts of Ahaziah, which he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? So, in Revelation 11, when it says that the uh, witnesses are going to bring, you know, fire out of their mouths, are their mouths going to be like flamethrowers? No, they're going to call down fire from heaven. Just like Elijah, one of the two witnesses, did in what we just read. So, let's go back to Revelation 11, verse 4. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Now, what happens when there's no rain? Uh, it's pretty hard to grow a garden, isn't it? And when plants don't grow, and you know, you don't have any food, right? Yeah. So, and guess what? Elijah said that there'd be no rain in Samaria. And that's in my hour and 40 minute Bible study on Elijah. He uh, proclaimed that there'd be no rain in, in Samaria for three and a half years, three and a half years, just like the 42 months here, the 1260 days. There was no rain for three and a half years in, in Israel. Food was pretty scarce. Oh, yeah. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood. Isn't that what Moses did in Egypt during the uh, before the first Passover? Absolutely. And have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast, the beast, John calls him the beast. Paul calls him uh, the man of sin, the son of perdition. I forget. Somebody else calls him the Antichrist. It's all the same person. And when they, the two prophets, shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Yeah, the world's going to rejoice. Oh, we got rid of these two prophets, those prophets that were turning the waters into blood and keeping it from raining and bringing fire down from the sky. The beast won the war. He killed them. Oh, yeah. Let's read verse 8. Now, this is the whole, verse 8 is the whole reason why I'm reading this chapter. So, they're going to, and, um, and when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them 
the two witnesses, Elijah and whoever, I think Enoch, but that's just my guess, and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies, their dead bodies, shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. Whoa, Egypt, huh? And Sodom. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Huh. You know, when people tell you that Mystery Babylon is New York City or Rome, do you know what they're telling you? That their Messiah is not Jesus. Yeah, that's what they're telling you. Ask them, uh, what was the name of your Messiah who was crucified in New York City? What's the name of your Messiah who was crucified in Rome? Not by Rome. No. Pilate tried to release Jesus. Yeah. Pilate wanted to release Jesus. P Paul... The, the one that those all those Hebrew Roots people hate, tells you who crucified Jesus, and he didn't say the word Pilate. No. It rhymes with uh, newspapers. Remove the word papers and take the first word, uh, the first letter of that, you know, and then put a J in front of it. Yeah. Yeah, that's who killed Jesus, not Pilate not Rome. But it says, where also our Lord was crucified. Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem. Not New York City, not Mecca, not Rome. I mean, you know, the Bible explains the Bible, if you will let it. And their dead bodies, the two witnesses, shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. Doesn't sound very good. Egypt being compared with Sodom. Well, guess what? Sodom and Egypt were both from the um, line of Ham, you know, along with the Canaanites. Where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer or allow their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another. Sounds like Christmas time to me. Because these two prophets tormented them that dwell dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them, which saw them. Yeah, I thought we got rid of those two prophets. We killed them and they're dead laying there for three and a half days. And then suddenly they're going to stand up. Verse 12. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. You want to talk about being scared? Oh, yeah. And the same hour there was a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. And the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. See, there's going to be a remnant that's going to give glory to the God of heaven. See, people are going to read this prophecy and say, Oh, it's going exactly the way those crazy Christians were telling us it would. Maybe they were right all along. Verse 14. Of course we're right. 
The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded. And there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. You didn't know God was an environmentalist, did you? And shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was open in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. Uh, a quick little thing here. What do you want to bet that the uh, you-know-whos are going to discover the ark of the Te covenant? I bet you they're going to make a fake copy. You know, that, that movie, uh, Indiana Jones... I forget, whatever. And you know Harrison Ford is one of them. Uh, what do you want to bet that whole movie was just to uh, get people in the mindset that, you know, they discovered or they know where the Ark is? I bet you they're going to fake have a fake Ark. And you know all the TV preachers on TV, TBN... If, if they say it, millions are going to believe it. Oh, glory to God. They found the Ark of the Covenant and they're going to build a temple. Uh, yeah. They're going to build a temple for their Messiah. Not for Jesus. And the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in his temple the Ark. See, the Ark is in heaven, people. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Just like the um, plagues of Egypt. You know, just like the plagues of Egypt. Well, not totally like it, but very, uh, sim there are similarities and there is differences also. So, all right. Um, this is the end of Revelation chapter 11. Um, I'm just touching the surface on Egypt. I mean, I could do an entire series on just Egypt. But, uh, yeah, you get the general idea. You know? Uh, and their dead bodies, the two witnesses, shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Revelation 11.8. And there you go. Sodom and Egypt. Two places where the children of Ham and the Canaanites uh, occupied. So, isn't it funny that... Uh, the children of the devil, devils, uh, went exactly to the promised land to oppose the children of Israel. Coincidence? I think not. I think God uh, had revealed to Satan, the devil, um, the plan, and uh, the devil tried to thwart it and, uh, you know, try to make it look that way, but ain't gonna happen you know so all blessings praise glory and honor to god the father and his only begotten son jesus who is the christ the lamb of god slain from the foundation of the world in jesus precious name amen